Welcome to Big Group Learning. If you have not gotten a kazoo, child and adult alike, you need to get a kazoo. Don't ever say we didn't give you anything. I'm glad you're teaching tonight and not me. All right, all the kazoo players, lower your kazoos. All the kazoo players, lower your kazoos for a moment. Sister Wendy, you look like you're smoking something. Cut it out. I'm trying to wait for you all to settle down, but my goodness, none of you are settling down and you're worse. The, the, the adults are worse than the kids. All right. Okay, kazoo's down, please. Let me take care of a couple of things real quick and get out of the way. Uh, first of all, welcome back to Big Group Learning. Glad you're here. And uh, we're excited to have you here. Second part of our four weeks with four different teachers dealing with first fruits. And so welcome back. Glad that you're here. And uh, all of you should have a kazoo. All adults and children should have a kazoo. All children and teenagers, you should have a worksheet. It is double-sided. And uh, so that's that should be available to you. If you don't, you want to slip out in the lobby and get one um, quickly. All right. The second thing that I want to mention to you as well is tonight we begin the first of three weeks. We're following uh, class. We need the parents and or legal guardians of our children according to the parents and or legal guardian's last name. Not the child's last name, but you, the parent, the person who has to sign the medical release forms. We need you to stay behind in the reception room and help us get those on file, all right? If you are bringing children with you that you are not the parent and or legal guardian and your last name is in the range that we announced, please stop in there, pick them up, and take them home, all right? And you will then be the witness, the person that's bringing them, you will be the witness to the parent signing them. But the rest of you that are here you're either the parent and or the legal guardian of the child. We need medical release forms in preparation for May. And so tonight we're working with those of you whose last names end in letters A through K. Everybody say A through K. Say K. All right. If your last name, the parent and or legal guardian's last name ends in one of those letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, or K. I do. Sister Debbie, would you get your convert under control? We need you to stay behind in the reception room. Sister Leela and Regina will be there to uh, facilitate that answer any questions on the forms, and get those filled out. With the new format starting in May where you're dropping your kids off, we do not have the ability to then immediately get a hold of you. And because we do not immediately have the ability to get a hold of you, if on the off chance there was an emergency that occurred, we need that release form in order to make sure your child is safe and secure all the way to the point of, if necessary, to transport them to Christiana Hospital. The good news is we are very close to Christiana Hospital, so we can get there very quickly, um, but it will need to, we'll need that medical release form in order to get them treated, all right? And so that's part of the new system with you dropping them off. When you were here, the reason we did not ask for those is because we could literally make a phone call or run across the parking lot, and in less than a minute, you were there, and then you would be able to take care of all that needed to be done for, for taking care of your child. But with the new format where you might be at the mall, maybe you're back home, 
maybe you're running an errand, you could be 15, 20 minutes, even 30 minutes out. That's not going to be acceptable to make sure your child is safe and cared for. All right? So we need you A through K to stop into the reception room and be available there. All right, let me hit it again. All adults should have a kazoo. All the adults with a kazoo, wave it at me. Come on. All right, good. Because I already know the kids have got their kazoos. I'm not even worried about that. All of the kids should have a worksheet. All of the kids, do you have worksheets? There we go. Good, 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 good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right. So last week, I introduced to us the principle of first fruits. Namely, that everything belongs to God. It always has. It always will. So everything that we have comes from Him. God gave us the principle that He wants us to acknowledge that everything that we have has come from Him. And so our acknowledgement is He says, Give me the first and give me the best of everything. And so when we do that, God receives. We offer it, and God receives it as thanksgiving. Good, you had memory. I was wondering to see whether anybody were to remember. We offer it, and God receives it as thanksgiving. Not only thanksgiving for the... Not only it for... Yeah, I'm not saying it again. Not only that word for the past... But it is also the realization that there is more to come. In other words, that our future provisions, whatever they be, whether they be food, whether it be talents, skills, money, whatever it is, that it will be provided by God. And so we gave thanks for the past and we give thanks for the future. All right. So now we're moving into three lessons that are going to take this principle and apply it specifically into specific areas. So it's my privilege to get out of the way to turn this pulpit and this class over to my wife, who's going to be dealing with one of those aspects of our acknowledgement, which is our worship and our praise. Would you put your hands together and invite my, not invite my wife, give honor to my wife as she comes to teach us. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right. Well, I'll keep talking and they'll find my level. All right. So, you guys look great. You sound great. We were discussing, you know. Okay. Here's the deal with kazoos. You only do them when you're supposed to do them. All right? We, and I'll tell you when you're supposed to do them, okay? Hang in there. We were talking about the kazoo idea, and we said, okay, let's get kazoos for all the kids. And then I found a group of cheap kazoos from Amazon, and we said, okay, let's do kazoos for everybody. So here we have kazoos for all. We are an equal opportunity kazoo church. All right, so... Some of you haven't heard me teach before, some of you have, and this is a different kind of format. So I ask that you hang in there with me. I'll make you a few guarantees. I'll guarantee you that you will hear or see something new that you had never heard or seen before. I guarantee you that you will be bored at some point, okay? Because we're reaching for a broad audience from 3 to 83 or 93 or whatever the oldest person here is. And uh, so at some point you'll be bored. But let's treat it like the weather, that if you don't like it, just hang in there about five minutes and it'll change. Um, Unfortunately, our weather hasn't changed that much lately, but I keep hoping. Um, So we will will do all kinds of different things. Kids, here's what you're going to do with the kazoos. When I announce a scripture, now that doesn't mean every time the scripture changes, but when I say a new scripture, okay, so if I say, Psalms 1, verse 1, you're going to announce it with your kazoo, like, do, 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 or da, da, okay? So let's try that. So if I'm going along and I say, Psalms 1, verse 1 says, 
There we go. Okay, then you're going to put them down. Not five minutes of kazoo, or we'll have to put them away. Adults, your kazoos are for something else, which we will get to in about a minute. So, the tie-in of first fruits and worship, of offering and worship, of sacrifice and worship, comes, we're going to use Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. So, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. So tonight, I bring to you the first time ever the world premiere of the Newark UPC Congregational Kazoo Choir. So everybody stand up. And we're going to sing a song. We're not going to sing a song. We're going to kazoo a song that you should all be familiar with. And it is, we bring a sacrifice of praise. Okay? So we put the words up there because your brain probably associates a tune with the words. So let's say, let's start on the note. uh, We, okay, everybody find the note. We, okay, I'm going to conduct you, okay? So when I'm doing this, you're going to blow real loud. And when I'm doing this, you're going to be real quiet, okay? So you ready? One, two, ready, go. We bring sacrifice of praise into the house. Of the Lord, we bring sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. A sacrifice of thanksgiving and offer up to you a sacrifice. Hey, one more time. We this is great. You guys are good. Now, as music director of the church, I would ask that you please don't bring your kazoos on Sunday morning. All right. So, we'll start at the beginning, or the Old Testament at least, and let's just talk about some of the various worship and praise verses that are out there. So you kids got your kazoos ready because we're going to hit them. Boom, boom, boom. Now, you only get to do a little toot and then we're done, okay? Um, and what I want you to do is watch and listen for the praising or worshiping words in these scriptures, okay? Psalms 34 verse 1. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. Psalm 95, verse 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Isaiah 25, verse 1. O Lord, I will honor and praise your name, for you are my God. You do such wonderful things. You planned them long ago, and now you have accomplished them. Psalms 32, verse 11. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. 
Psalm 44, verse 8. O oh God, we give glory to you all day long and constantly praise your name. Psalm 7, verse 17. I will thank the Lord because he is just. There we go. I, we got left over from last week. But we get. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 33, verse 1. Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. First Chronicles 16.34 Give thanks to the Lord For he is good His faithful love endures forever Psalm 98 verse 4 Shout to the Lord all the earth Break out in praise and sing for joy Psalm 29 verse 2 Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 66, verse 4. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. Psalm 144, verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, O God. I will sing your praises with a tin-stringed harp. And last one for now, Psalm 20, verse 5. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. Next, we're going to have a small activity for the kids. If you are in, if your teacher is Shara, Sister Shara and Sister Becky, or Sister Lynn and Sister Kaylee's class, I'd like you to come up to the front section here. Quickly, quickly. Shara's class, Sister Becky's class, Sister Lynn's class. No, the teachers don't want to come. Sister Lynn's class, Sister Kaylee's class. Come on. These kids are going to act out some words for us. Come on, just right here so everybody can see you. Actually, you know what? Come up here because you're too short. They can't see you. Jasmine, Autumn. Okay, just stand right here. Some of you go over there so that people can see half and half. Half of you stay here. Okay, come on. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a word that can be translated as praise or worship. It's a worship word. He doesn't have to. He can if he wants. Okay. And I, when I say it, I want you guys to do it. Okay? Be careful, though, because there's an edge right there. And some of the words are pretty active, and I don't want you to hurt yourself. Okay? So be careful. And don't run into the orchestra pit. Okay. First word. Kneel. Come on, guys. Kneel. Neil, good job. Come on, Neil. Go ahead, do it. Oh, this is going to take a while. Okay. Bow. Do you know how to bow? Okay. Spin around. I'm going to go pretty quick. Spin around. Okay. Praise. How would you praise? How would you show that? Somebody said praise. Oh, we have some teaching to do. Okay. Uh, Shout for joy. Come on, shout. Now, I know you guys can be noisy because I've heard you. Can you shout? Can you give me a big shout? Like, yay, if somebody... Yay! There you go. Okay. Uh, Fall down flat. Fall down flat. Fall down flat. There we go. Yay, very good. Okay, uh, sing. So get up and sing. There we go. I love it. I only heard one singing, though. Can we get some more singing? No? You guys are shy. You weren't shy with your kazoos. Give Thanksgiving. How would you give Thanksgiving? Yay, Yay, there you go. Okay. Um, Worship with extended hands. Any ideas? Worship with extended hands? Hands in the air? Yeah, okay. Okay. Play instruments. Pretend you're playing an instrument, like air guitar or air piano or something. Okay. Here's where you got to be careful. Jump. Rejoice. Like you're happy. Somebody just gave you a birthday present. Rejoice. Yeah, there we go. Okay, raise up. I don't know how you, if you were raising something up, what would you do with it? It's yours. Raise it up. 
Okay. Um, celebrate. It's your birthday. What would you do? Yay! Cake. Somebody's saying cake. Speak. How would you speak? Talking. Very good. Even though no one's doing it. Okay. Make glad or be glad. Yay. You're doing very well. Thank you. Call aloud. How would you call out loud? If you want your mom in the middle of the night, what do you do? Yo. Yeah. I know you guys all know how to call aloud. I promise you that. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, Become low before. So I think that's like the lay flat one. So make yourself low. All right. Oh. Somebody's not very low. We have the three Hebrew children here. Okay, get up and show me a dance. Uh-oh. That's, a good, that's some good dancers here. Come on, give me a dance. Oh, a chicken dance. That's good. All right. How about, um, how about, where am I at? I lost my place. Whirl. Whirl around. A whirly gig. Clap. You guys can clap. Okay, stretch forth or stretch out. Make yourself real big. Okay, make a loud noise. Now they're getting it. See, now several of them are combining. You see that? When they start making a loud noise, they jump and shout and add it all together. Okay, leap. Can you leap? Leap. Stamp. Can you stamp? Stamp, stomp. Okay, very good. All right. And here's the last one. And on the way back to your seats, I want you to split the ears with sound. Can you split my ears with your sound? Scream. Scream real loud. All right, go sit down. Very good job. Some other words that I figured would be a little hard for them to do are... Are uh, rave about, be clamorously foolish about, play instruments, sing a spontaneous hymn, boast upon, make glorious, make weighty, triumph, be conspicuous with banners, glory in, observe a festival, and there's many, many more um, words that are translated in our Bible as praise and worship. And we lose some of that. Um, in English, but all of those things have come come with the idea of praise and worship. Um, so, is there a difference in praise and worship, and what is it? Well, since we're going from Hebrew to English, it's not quite as easy as just going to Webster's Dictionary and pulling it out. But like I said, there are a ton of different words in Hebrew. That are, that are translated but as praise and worship. And it's not always real clear a difference. But there is a tendency with them that worship, when it's translated, involves a humility. It involves a bowing down of ourselves and our will. A perfect verse for this. <coughs> you guys are asleep. A perfect verse for this is Psalms 95, verse 6. Thank you. Okay, my fault, my fault. So, um, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. This, this verse in Hebrew is basically all verbs. But it's come, let us worship, bow down. Both of those kind of mean the same thing. Let us kneel before the Lord I Maker. All of those things have to do with kind of a worship context. Um, praise, in in a contrast to that, is a more boisterous, loud, joyful, musical word. Most of the words that I had them acting out would have been translated as praise, with the exception of like the make yourself flat or the kneel, those kind of things. All the other ones we would call praise or the Bible would translate as praise. Um, an example of this, just a little trivia thing, is halal, which is a Hebrew word that means basically praise. 
But when we turn it and when we use the word hallelujah, it's basically almost, it's like a Hebrew sentence all in that word. And it's basically saying, hey, you, get your praise on. Or the Bible would say, praise you the Lord. There's nothing magical about this word. There's nothing super special about this word. It's just a word that sounds cool to us, and so we use it in all kinds of contexts. But really what it means is, hey, you, praise the Lord. Okay? So, um, praise is the lifting and celebration of him, and it has to be balanced with the worship, the humility or lowering of us. And people tend to get in trouble because they try to do one or the other, and it needs to be balanced. Um, Musicians tend to get out of balance um, because musicians get a lot of attention, I can say, because I are one. Um, They're up on stage a lot. People are looking at them. They're leading the congregation in whatever they do. And um, if we're not careful, it can go to our heads. So we have to have that praise balanced with the humility of the worship. The very, the idea that a musician or a praiser, somebody who's publicly praising would miss that humility side of it is quite absurd because they go like this. And we'll talk some about that Um, because it's not about us. It's all about him. It is only about us in that we're trying to make ourselves be in the right position in relation to him. So let's talk a little bit about what the ancient Near Eastern culture of worship was and um, what was around them in Old Testament times when these verses were all written. What was the context that God was working with and communicating to them in because he always tries to meet us where we are and he still does that today and I'm thankful for that. So in the context of the Old Testament, the Near Eastern, the ancient Near East, um, which is what we call that whole area, um, they had God and king and God king. There wasn't the definite difference like we talk about today. Um, They would assume that their Pharaoh, if he wasn't already a god, as soon as he died, he would become a god. Um, Even in the Roman world, which I consider really modern, um, <laughs> they missed that. I tease my husband because he likes the Roman Greek stuff. I like the like Assyrian, ancient, ancient stuff. So I call his stuff modern. But um, even in the Roman times, there was this idea of a god king. Um, so it wasn't as clear in their heads the difference. They had temples and they had palaces and they had temple palaces. In Hebrew, the word for temple is the word for palace, and you just tell by context, which it is. It's exactly the same word for temple and palace, both. Um, so in our mind, it's real clear that a king was not a god and a god was, was not a king. But in their minds, it was pretty mixed. So let's see how they treated their kings. And by that, we can see how, kind of what they were thinking as well as God. So we're going to have a little show and tell. And we're going to talk about greater than and less than. You kids in school, kids who used to be in school, um, should remember from math the concept of greater than, less than. So they give you a five and a three, and you'd have to put the little symbol in the middle. So five is greater than three, three is less than five, just a different way of saying the same thing. And this idea in their world was very pronounced when it came to the common person and the king. So generally, the thing they did was some variation of prostration or falling flat, bowing down. It was kind of an ancient version of limbo, except it was forward. You know, how low can you get when the kids went like flat all the way to the ground? That was the kind of thing that they did. For all vocabulary geeks out there, I wanted to teach a new word called proskynesis, which is just a big word for making yourself really flat. Okay, so let's look at some, and I'm going to come over here because, well, no, I'll turn around some. Um, The first one we have, Nick, if you can give me the next one without me killing myself. This is um, 
This is the first picture we have of a biblical character. And this is Jehu, who was a bad driver, if you read the Bible. Um, he bows before Shalmaneser III of Assyria. Um, you can guess who made this steely. It wasn't Jehu. Um, it was Shalmaneser III. He was telling everybody how great and cool he was. So this is the idea of kind of how low can you go. The next one um, is the idea of thrones and throne rooms. We, we remember the story of Esther, Esther going in before the king, Esther needing his grace or she was going to be killed, okay? And he had the throne room, the throne. So let's look at another really old column or steely. They'd put these things up in the middle of town or along a busy road, something they'd put this big piece of rock. They'd usually have some writing on it for the few people that could read. And for the other people, it would have a picture on it, like Jehu bowing, or this is Hammurabi. So at the bottom, we have one of the first law codes ever written down. The next slide shows the top of it, which was, who's most important here? Even though he's lower, who's the most important guy? The guy on the left or the guy on the right? right. The guy on the right. He's in nice clothes, and he's sitting on a throne. Next is a cool story I want to tell you, which is not ancient at all, but I just like the story. So we have... In 1600s Africa, think of 1600s Africa, the Portuguese are meeting with a young Angolan lady. Her name is Nzinga, Queen Nzinga. And she goes in to meet the Portuguese guys, all older white guys probably. I mean older, they were white guys. Um, and they're all seated in, a, in a, these big fancy chairs. And they walk in, she walks in, and they tell her to sit on the floor. She knows that if she's sitting on the floor, she's not going to get a very good deal. So she has one of her servants sit down and make her a throne, and she sits on her servant the whole time. And she got a pretty good deal. But that's Queen and Zinga. Another idea of a throne and making yourself not lower than the other person. Okay, um, another thing we get is big word called hierarchical proportion, um, which is the idea of who's bigger in the thing, in the picture. Again, we had people that couldn't read. We had people that couldn't um, figure out what those, all those writings were saying, but they could look at a picture and see what's going on. So next thing we have is um, Narmer palette. This is very old. It's from Egypt. Um, let's see. Angela, who do you think the most... But actually, go to the next one uh, and tell me, Angela, who you think the most important guy here is. The blue guy, the red guy, the green guy. Can you tell? Who do you think the big blue guy, right? Um, there's actually some people down here at the bottom who are dead. You can't see them. Um, they don't count. Um, so anybody looking at this would know, okay, this is, the, this is the big guy. He's got a crown on his head. Okay, next we have... Um, a couple of the standard of Ur. This is really old, and this is a harder one because we have a ton of people on here. These people are feasting. Who do you think is the most important person? Yeah, okay. And yes, this Ur is like Ur of the Chaldees that Abraham left. Same Ur. Okay, next one is the opposite side of this, and it's called war. Who do you think the most important guy here is? The guy in the middle at the top, I don't know if he was originally white or if he just wore off. But you see his head reaches above everyone else's. Okay, next we have, this is an Akkadian one. And it's a little harder to see maybe, but who do you think the most important guy is here? The guy at the top, yes. These guys are in various states of either being dead or being his warriors. Um, okay, next... And they're smaller. They're all smaller. This is, uh, where do you think this comes from? Egypt. Egypt. You're art history scholars. Okay. Um, so we have some people here. We have this guy. We have this lady. We have this person. Who's the most important? The big guy. That's not hard, is it? Okay, next we have, this is from Nineveh. Um, yes, that Nineveh. Here we have a big lion. 
Okay, so he's big. If we're looking at who's big, the lion's big. He has a spear coming out of his head, though, so, you know. Um, but we also wouldn't want our opposition to be seen as a little pussy, pussycat or something. So, um, who's, who's most important of these guys? The big guy. Okay, next. We have some statues. We uh, have statues. Ramses II is probably the guy that Moses went into and said, let my people go. He had no shortage of ego. And he liked to build and he lived for a very long time. So we have things still around today that are supposed to be Ramses. And there he is. This is the British Museum. Hang on, go back one more time. Um, these are the people, and I have seen this, and it's huge. And this isn't even the whole statue, of course. It's just the top. Um, the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote the poem Ozymandias about this, if you like poetry. Okay, the next one is a bunch of different statues at a place called... Abu Simbel in Egypt. Again, you have four people, and then you have little people. So this is a big message to the people of Egypt. I'm bigger than you. I'm more important than you. So, you know, do what I say. Um, next slide, just for fun, shows what Ramses looks like today. We still have him around. He had red hair, believe it or not. Okay, the next one. Is just a reminder of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, which he expected the three Hebrew children to bow to. Um, and it was about three times as tall as this church. Okay? And looking at those statues, you can imagine that that could be. Um, the next one is a modern example. It still matters. Obama got in all kinds of trouble here. Why? Because he was bowing to the Japanese, I think, or Chinese or somebody. And they said he was kowtowing, which in their culture means a lot. To us, it doesn't mean that much. But people didn't like him doing that. And another one that we all know. <laughs> so position still does matter. And it's rather ironic because I didn't plan, I mean, I did plan this, but I didn't notice that the next slide, again, goes to back to the greater than, less than thing, where your position is telling either I'm submit, you know, I'm begging you something, I'm asking you something, making myself lower than you, you're bigger than me, and this is the idea behind that worship, behind those worship words, where... Um, the idea of making yourself lower, the humility, all of those things. So God ordered this kind of thing. He uh, asked for us to praise him. He asked for us to worship him. David helped us because that was his gifting, and he wrote it all down. And that's a shameless plug for um, lesson number four, his gifting and talents and all that stuff. He asked for us to bring gifts. He asked for us to have festivals to acknowledge him. Sacrifices, incense, instruments, singing, dancing. All of these things were praise. And as we talked last night, last week about the sacrifices, but there is a way to do it. You can't just do it any old way and have it work. Because if we do it any old way, then it doesn't have the humility, it doesn't have the obedience, okay? So um, how can we have first fruits or giving God the best and the first things of our life, of our praise, of our worship? Let's go to Isaiah 1, verses 11 through 14. Ah, thank you. Uh, the Lord is rather disappointed, mad, ticked off, whatever you want to call it. And he says to his people, what makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord. Well, what makes them think that they want the sacrifices is that he told them to sacrifice. Hello? But he says, what makes you think I want all your sacrifices? I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the fattened calf. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to worship me, who asked you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? 
Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts of incense of your offering. Uh, uh, sorry, your incense. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they are all sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. These are all things that God told them to do, but it seems like somebody has done something wrong and made God mad. Isaiah 29, 13, same book. Thank you. And so the Lord says, These people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. So the same kind of concept. And we say, okay, that's Old Testament. Let's come into the New Testament with Mark 12. He says, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So he isn't, and it's not good enough for us just to come clap our hands. It's not good enough for us just to come sing a song. It's not good enough for us just to come do something we've always done. He wants our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, our first, our best, our first fruits, things that acknowledge him, that put him first, that show him how thankful we are. In Matthew 15, 1 through 10, thank you, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. Isn't that nice? They came to see him. They asked him, oh, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Jesus replied, Why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, Sorry, I can't help you, for I vowed to give to God what I would have given you. In this way, you say you don't need to honor their... They say they don't need to honor their parents... And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, and this is what what we just referred to, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear, listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. So it isn't okay for us to to come go through the motions. It doesn't do us any good to come and just do what's always been done because it's always been done. We need to think about the words we're singing. We need to think about our attitude as we're singing them. We need to think about the priorities we're setting in our life. And it is important for us to come. I'm not telling us not to come and sing. I'm telling us to come and sing right, with right hearts. And that is the first fruits concept. Um, we have a couple of other places in the New Testament. We don't have near as much in the New Testament as we do the Old. But referring to singing and making melody. Ephesians 5, 15 through 19. I want you to listen to these things. The context of singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs comes in at the end. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music in the Lord, to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And very similar list of things in Colossians three sixteen through 17. 
Um, thank you. Let me find 16. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So again, singing and making melody in our hearts sounds all fun and great, but it's not just that. We need to to put it in a broader context, a broader worship of life that involves thankfulness, a life that involves putting God first, giving God the best. Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So in the New Testament, they're trying to get us to realize that worship is more than a chorus. It's more than a song set. In fact, our whole service is worship, right? Communion is worship. Taking a cake to your neighbor is worship. Being thankful. Kids, being thankful and obedient. Obedient to your parents and cleaning your room and picking up your socks. and <coughs> Oh, I, I slipped that one there and there, didn't I? Now I'm getting down to where we live. Um, another way to, to have the... F- the first fruits concept is in our life, as we're going along, trying to do these things, this worship of God in our life. Sometimes it's not easy. You ever realize that? I, anybody else have a life that sometimes has bumps? Yeah, I think so. Anybody have a life that doesn't have bumps? No, I didn't think so. So... Um, in Acts 16, we get this story. We get this story. I didn't want to read the whole big thing, but most of you know it. But anyway, in case you don't, I'll remind you. Paul and Silas um, have gotten in trouble for doing the right thing. Sometimes we get in trouble for doing the right thing. And that is our, its own type of worship and first fruits, right? Doing the right thing, whatever. So, Paul and Silas are in jail, and about midnight, um, I I think they might have been actually praying and singing for a while, but this thing happened at midnight, so that's what we get. Um, They're praying and singing hymns to God. Now, they've been beat. They're in a jail in stocks and bonds, and by that I don't mean like the Dow Jones Industrial Average kind of stocks and bonds. I mean the the you know the if you've been to Williamsburg the hands and feet you can't get comfortable in that. Besides, they're in a prison and prisons weren't they were worse then than they are now. Um, sanitation was a problem. They didn't have you know a four course meal. Um, so this wasn't a good time in their life as far as comfort level. But somehow. Around midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And what happens is an earthquake comes and um, shakes them loose, and they, they, um, the jailer becomes a convert. It's a great story. But the thing I would like to talk about is Paul and Silas in jail, um, a sacrifice of praise, even when it isn't easy. Um, when you are in pain, when you have financial problems, when you and your husband fought on the way to church, um, when 
your parents are sick or your kids are sick or your kids are having some kind of addiction problem or your kid, you know, all of the things. I'm talking big major things. We're not talking hangnail here. Paul and Silas didn't have a hangnail. They had some major issues <laughs> that, that had to be dealt with. But instead of talking to each other about how mean somebody was to put them there, instead of gossiping about sister so-and-so in the church, instead of just, you know, doing the turtle and trying to get some rest and get through the night in this stupid jail that they shouldn't be in anyway. No, they sang and prayed to God. The other thing is the other prisoners were listening. You know, when people see our lives and the things we're going through, and we don't have to put all our business on Facebook, but our close friends know what we're going through. And in the world and out, they're watching us to see what we do. And if we have that worship, that humility, that flat, flat before you, God, I got nothing on you. Or that praise, that rejoicing, celebratory, I'm in this bad spot. It's really stinky in here. And I don't like this place that I'm in. But you worship and you praise anyway then it's a sacrifice, and God honors that. And we can take, um, take that and offer it to God like the widow's might. She didn't have much to give. She just had two little coins. And you know what? Our singing might be out of tune. I'll be singing around the house, and my kids will say, Mom, shh. You know, my voice isn't a great solo voice, and half the time the I have a pretty limited range, so I can't hit the high notes or whatever. But you know what? That doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because it, it helps. And I can tell you when you're going through a tough time, singing or reading the word or praying, listening to music. If you can't sing, get a playlist or get a, you know, if you're older, get a CD you like or whatever and put it on and just have a little moment. Um, I have this memory. I have a, uh, I like to think it's genetic, but I'm a hummer, not like a car. But uh, a, uh, I hum. My mother hums, her mother hummed, and Caleb hums. Um, I, I would be somewhere as a teenager. I remember one time I was in, the, in our church building, and no one else is there, and I heard somebody come in, and if you've never been in a church building by yourself and someone comes in, it's kind of scary. You're like, okay, friend or foe, you know. Um, but I heard the person humming, and I knew right away it was my mom, because mom always hums anywhere she goes. So I have this memory of my grandmother, and my grandmother, this is her mom, she didn't have a great life. She was not very wealthy. She had health problems and, you know little tiny town in Oklahoma, nobody's ever going to, she wasn't going to make the news. Well, she did make the news one time when a tornado took her house away, but um, that was, that was a big deal. <laughs> Funny story that has nothing to do with the lesson. She got up in the middle of the night because the tornado was coming and got dressed in the dark. Her, it saved her house. I mean, the house got the roof taken off. And she realized, taking off her dress that night, that all day long she'd had her dress on inside out. And this was the day she was on national TV. So, this was my grandma. Beautiful, sweet person, though. And I remember her going around the house, singing things like, Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Or there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. And it wasn't anything that was, you know, Carnegie Hall. But it was something I remember about my grandma. That it was part of her that even in tough times, and she had them, there was a song. And I just want to tell you, 
I'm thankful for all you've done. And um, there have been times that I haven't felt like singing. You know, I felt like I was in a jail, a bad acre. That's, that's been my biggest one, but, you know, I standing in the kitchen, cooking supper, because I might as well hurt standing up as laying down. And I have a few select songs that get me through. And I think we can all do that. Even if you're not a singer, if you're, if you're not a hummer, find a way to encourage yourself in the Lord. To acknowledge that I got nothing on you, God. I don't know why. I don't know why. But in the storm, in the jail, in the whatever, I'm going to turn my eyes up on Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. Even when you're not trusting him. Because that song also has verses this. The very last part of the chorus is, oh, for grace to trust him more. Because you know what? We don't trust him that much. But if we have the idea of giving God our first, giving God our best, and you know what? There were probably times in the Old Testament where their first fruits, they had had a hailstorm the night before, and it had beat their crops to nothing. Or they had had a You know, a worm got into their pomegranate tree and ate all their pomegranates. But maybe there were a couple that were kind of okay. Maybe there were a couple that were only half eaten. And if that's all the first fruits you got, but it's your best and it's your first, then you take it to God. And in life, Live, you know, the times when you're not in the jail, you certainly want to live your life in the context of those singing hymns and making melody in your heart and thankfulness. And, and you take the cake to the neighbor and you, you, uh, you know, you're nice to the person in the grocery store that's had a bad day. And you, you uh, when your teacher sends your kid home with a note about how they misbehaved, and, and you know precious little Johnny couldn't have done that. You don't call her and ream her out. Um, living a life, a constant life that acknowledges two things. One, that I'm flat before you, God. I'm just flat. I got nothing. And the other is the celebration, the joyous, the singing, all the things these kids were doing, whirling and waving banners and making praise glorious and all of these things. We, we look at David, and I'll close with this. At Family Altar here a while back, we read through the Psalms. And after about 30 nights of doing this, because we read one a night, I think 119, we might have split up a little bit. But anyway, um, 117's a breeze, 119, yeah. Anyway, um, but we talked about how David was, my kids noticed it. They're like, man, David was in the doldrums. He had a problem. He had a, he had a depression issue or something, really. But where do we get our, our praise literature from? Our, our songs and our all these praises from we get them from David who has 
I think he probably had clinical depression. Um, he was being, you know, he was chased around by Saul. His family fell apart, partly his own problem, but um, he didn't have an easy life. He had plenty of problems, but he's still praising God, and he's given God his best, and he's given God his first. And I hope that in our lives, we can do that as well. So, I want to have the Kazoo Choir stand back up. Should we sing a different song? Sing, yeah. sing unto the Lord a new song. How about we do Jesus Loves Me for the kids? No, let's do different. Let's do praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning. All right? Let's see. Here's our first note. Praise. All right. Ready, go. Praise him. Praise. Praise Him in the morning, praise Him in the noontime, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him when the sun goes down. Again, love Him. Do you have any announcements? I got to turn off. As it was, whoa, Nick's got me up loud. As it was um, last week, on your way out, kids, if you have worked on your worksheet, stop by the desk out there. We have a snack for you. If you borrowed a Bible, turn it back in. Adults, hold on for one second. I want to put a very fine point for all of you. As you saw the picture of Jehu prostrate before God, or Shamanizer, sorry, not God, but before Shamanizer, our worship, that attitude of humility, is how we put in our life God first. Stop and think about it. It's your will, Lord, not mine. It's your plans, not mine. I don't know what's happening in life, but I trust you. And that posture, because Jehu could prostrate before a physical king who sat on a physical throne, but our king we can't see. His throne is not visible. So how do we prostrate? And I know some in our movement have gotten a little goofy about it. They tried to turn it into the physical, and so then, you know, somehow you're holier, you're more powerful when you're... No, 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 no. God is looking for us to put him first. His ways, his kingdom. Jesus said, seek ye Somebody else say it, seek me, seek my kingdom first. Then from that posture, everything we do for him, our songs, our praise, our work, our building, everything we do for him comes from a right posture. And that is our best. So our first is our worship. Our best is in our praise. All right. It's been an exciting night. Been very loud. Who knows what next week is. You don't want to miss it. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.